Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Connections with myself, Cameron Bunch, and my father, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch. Sorry we missed last week. I actually had a work training engagement with a scholarship group I help out with. For those of you in Taft, you might be familiar with the scholarship. It's the Homes Family uh, and Education Scholarship. Um, and I'm one of the mentors. And so we had a training and it was a great time. But unfortunately, I had to miss this uh, episode, the last week's episode of Connections. But we're continuing this week and we're bringing you a new subject uh, matter. And it's going to be on leadership. Um, my dad and I will talk throughout the week on uh, see who has something kind of going on in their heart. And last week, actually, before I forgot that I had a training, I brought up the idea of leadership. And um, to be honest and transparent with all of you, the reason this has kind of been kicking around in my head is, um, and I think I've like mentioned it maybe on this podcast before that when I was getting out of college, I thought like, I'm ready to start a church. Like I'm ready to be a head pastor. Like I could do this. I can do, I can lead. I can do all these things. And it's become a real humbling reality that I'm very thankful one that God did not do that and grant that wish or desire. Cause I would have been crushed, but even more so recently, I'm just feeling the full weight and gravity of what it means to be a leader and a pastor of a church being responsible for those under you. And I mean, even in the Bible, when Jesus talks about uh, spiritual leadership and leading uh, people, he says, if one of you harms as much as one of these, referring to the children, but also spiritual children, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around their neck. And I'm like, wow, uh, that uh, changes a whole different level of responsibility yeah. when you're younger, like, yeah, 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 that's fine. Let's just go. But it's been something kind of brewing in my mind and in my heart and in my spirit of like, what does it take to be a good leader? And when are we ready? And what kind of leadership does our country need right now? And I don't just mean to exclude the rest of the world, but looking at primarily ministering to Americans, like what is it that we see the American church needs? Where is it lacking in leadership? And to kind of give some guidelines and background, there is in First Timothy 3 where Paul is writing to Timothy and he writes out in First Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Let me read it real quick. It's, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop or leader, overseer, this is translated different ways, but desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, quarrelsome, not covetous, and one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, just being purified up with, uh, no, oh, sorry, lest he be puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among all those outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So that's an exhaustive list that uh, Paul is giving to young men and different individuals in the church looking to be involved in leadership of the church. And while those are great and godly things, and I cannot discount anything Paul said because he was far wiser and had the anointing on him, our focus isn't mainly going to be to address those. But like I said, what do we see going on in the American church of where people are struggling, what leadership is effective right now and what is very much needed. So kind of giving that base, we're just going to kind of jump right into it. You know, it's interesting, Cameron, I was talking with someone many years ago and it occurred to me looking at that list and somebody was talking about, oh yeah, man, I wouldn't want to be a leader because God holds him to a higher standard. And I said, no, he doesn't. And I, I did this purposely to get their attention. I said, no, he doesn't. We'll be judged more strictly according to the standard but that list you just read is just called good Christianity. It's what every single believer should be living. There's not one of those things that's unique to leadership in the sense of leaders should do this, but normal Christians don't have to. People that are not in high profile positions of leadership can, can do other stuff. What he's basically saying is if you're going to be a leader, you need to epitomize the ideal of what it is to be a Christian, having your house in order, um, all, all those other things that are so fundamentally important to being a leader because you're going to be an example. The whole point of being an example is other people are supposed to be doing the same thing. So it's not that there is a higher standard for leadership. It's just that leadership has to be towing that line. 
and we're going to be judged more strictly according to the standard that God has given. He even says, let not many of you be teachers, knowing that we shall incur a stricter judgment, meaning that you're going to be held to that standard more tightly, I guess you could say, because you've taken upon yourself to be an influencer. And anytime we say, well, you know, I'm going to set myself up as a model, as a standard, then God's going to hold you up against that standard, right? And he's going to say, okay, how are you doing then? And I think, you know, these qualifications for leadership, I, I think one way to start off this well is just to say that the quality of our leadership is going to be determined by the quality of our Christians. And the problem of leadership in America is first and foremost, simply a discipleship problem. And if we have people that are genuine and authentic disciples, and I'm I'm saying this starting with moi, because I've fallen in leadership. I've failed in leadership at times in my life. I don't know many leaders who haven't failed on some level, but, but you know, we know from that what not to do sometimes. But just because we have failed or even because we've been doing well for a while, we should never take our eyes off that high lofty standard that God has set for leadership and recognize that if my walk with Christ is where it should be, then it's going to enable and empower me and qualify me to be a quality leader. But if my own walk with God is not where it needs to be, then how can I lead people where I have not gone? How can I be an exemplar of something that an, of an ideal that I have not aspired to myself? And I think that's an important place to start. Yeah, and I think that's great that you made the comment of we have in especially the church in America, I think a real lack of discipleship. Yeah. And one of the things that we see Jesus do very well in the Bible is disciple 12 disciples and they get the name disciples because of what he is doing yeah. and the reason i think it's so important that we go through a process of discipleship and have that um mentorship over us is that in that time what jesus was doing was helping them build character and we've all heard like your aptitude may get you in the room but character is where will, what will keep you there and oftentimes we might get launched onto a platform and launched into a room that is way too big for us, but yeah. our character is what keeps us there. Do we have that godly character that Paul lays out, or are we falling short in different areas? Yeah, your anointing will take you places your character can't keep you if you haven't developed that, and I, I, I absolutely think that's true. And another thing that's interesting is you see a lot of memes, even Christian memes on Facebook today, where they'll have kind of a joke like, you know, line for the spiritual gifts, and that line is, you know, back out through the door, and the next one says line for character or character development. There's nobody standing in it. And and that's what we're saying is that, you know, I, I've met a thousand and one anointed, gifted communicators flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, whatever names whom you can't even remember or who never fulfilled their purpose because of, you know, crashing on the rocks of, you know, moral failure or character failure. And it's not that one can't recover themselves, but there's just something about you know, leaders, they are, they are, um, what's the term in the military, a high, I want to say high profile target. Um, but the reason why is because if you take down a leader, you take down those that follow them. Jesus said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So they are a high, I'm forgetting the term now, high profile target, but there's another word for it. Um, because if the devil can take out a leader, then he takes out a lot of people and it brings discredit to the church. And so it's so important that we aspire to be good leaders by aspiring to be disciples and Christians that, you know, are authentic and true. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but we have to be sincere and we have to be, like Paul said, you know, ever striving to attain to that measure of the standard that Christ has set for us. Absolutely. And so kind of launching into some of the characteristics that, I mean, we kind of sat down and we're just praying and thinking through some scriptures and some characteristics that we see um, in like maybe that are more lacking in the American church or just lacking in general uh, as this generation is being raised up. And so I kind of, I personally came up with five little uh, characteristics, um, traits that a leader should have, and I'm going to be listing them in no particular order. So if you guys are like, I think you should have switched the order. I just put them down in no particular order. Um, I accept that. I think the first one is uh, probably, I would say the most important and that's God comes first. And that should be apparent to every, as we mentioned, like all these traits and everything are what a Christian should be living up to, but especially a leader should be recognizing that God really comes first, that they have submitted fully, that God is first and foremost in their life. Yeah. I mean, when the Ten Commandments were given, 
the first two were in regards to respecting God, his authority, and not honoring any other God, not recognizing, but God is first and foremost in our life. And that has not changed. Even when we have families, a lot of times people will be like, well, my family is the most important thing in my life. And it's like, but if you put God first, everything else will be taken care of. And so I put the God's comes first god's plans come first and i love the verse in isaiah 55 9 and it's a verse that i constantly remind myself of and it's for as the heavens are higher than the earth so my ways are higher than your ways my thoughts than your thoughts and i love this because it reminds me that god is in control and it's because he knows what's best for us we know he knows the best plan for our life the best course of action to take at all times he knows the best way if we fall to restore us if we're in debt to get us out. Mm -hmm. If we are broken and hurting the best way to heal us, God is first and foremost. And it's uh, Matthew six, oh gosh, it's the very last verse. I want to say like 31 or 39. I don't remember the last verse, which one it is in Matthew six, but it um, says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you Excellent. because when yeah. we put God first, everything else he will bring into line. Yeah, and if you don't have God first, if there's something that you have before God, number one, obviously it's an idol, but then that's what the devil will use to seduce you to sell out. Um, you know, Adam and Eve, their devotion was to God until the devil showed them something they wanted more than God, which was, I thought, a shortcut to achieving the goals that God promised them the long, hard way, right? And so... Um, the moment that they chose that over God or wanted that more than God, the devil used that to cause them to sell out to God. So if money is something you love more than God, the devil will throw money at you. If it's sex, then the devil will make sure he parades the right people across your path. Whatever it is that you love more than God or that you don't choose God over, the devil will use to you know, undermine your leadership and undermine your character, which is in itself undermining your leadership. So yeah, that's right. God definitely has to be first and foremost a commitment to him. And let me just say, commitment to God is like any other kind of commitment, whether you're talking about marriage or getting in shape or losing weight or meaning that you won't always feel like it. There's going to be times where, um, you know, we say, you know, I, I love my wife. Would you always feel love for her? What do you mean? Do I feel this, you know, I'm frolicking through the tulips kind of thing? No, we, we, it's a commitment. It's a decision that we make. Feelings follow the decision, the commitment. And everybody knows that a life lived according to commitment makes the relationship richer over the years, whereas something just based on convenience or personal, um, you know, lust or desire or personal interest doesn't carry the same weight or gravity to it, doesn't have, uh, produce the same quality of relationship. And likewise with God, there's going to be times where things are going to compete for your devotion and attention, you know, and it doesn't mean that we can't have interests. It doesn't mean that we can't like other things in our lives other than the call of God that we are pursuing, I think it's good to have hobbies. I think it's good to have things that, you know, we can do to kind of take our mind out of the work uh, and, you know, rest and play are important. That's why God put a Sabbath in the week. All those things are good, but if our devotion goes to any one of those things or anything before God, then ultimately we will be seduced by those things or things like them away from our devotion to God and our calling. I remember one time I was in college and I was, I'd called you and I was just kind of like venting and looking for wisdom. And I remember like talking about how everyone kind of in my, how I always kind of explain sin because everyone's like, well, that person's like tempted with this, but I would never be tempted. And I'm like, well, the fall of Adam affected everyone differently. Everyone has their own proclivities and things that they're more inclined to fall to. I've never been tempted in gambling or to drink or to do drugs. To me, those things I'm like, that seems like it would literally ruin my life. Why would I? But I remember I called you and I was frustrated because there's an area of my life I was trying to overcome and get like victory in. And I was like, and I feel like I just keep falling and failing. And you were just like, well, buddy, like the devil's going to keep going back where he keeps winning. And it's so true because if we have an area of weakness where we are not fully submitted to God to that, or we're not putting God first in every aspect of that, and it could be something as simple as your thought life. If you're preferring to, uh, daydream on things that are not biblical or godly, then the devil's going to start winning the rounds in your mind because he'll beat that battlefield and he'll keep pushing and pushing until he's won. And so we can't relent. 
So I think it's a good point that you mentioned that the, the devil will always go back to where he's got you last. I, I think it's also important that we never presume an area of strength in our life that we don't really have. I had an experience I've shared with you. I've preached about this many times. It's a whole sermon unto itself, but the Bible says, wherefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So there's a presumption of strength that obviously Paul's implying isn't really there. And I had preached on this same kind of thing. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, God will with the temptation provide a way of escape. And talking like you said, there are certain areas where I know there is a liability, there's a weakness. But then other areas, like you said, I'm typically not struggling with in the same level. And like you said, drinking, maybe one gambling, especially gambling. It's like, so what? You know, yeah, I drank in high school a little bit, you know, like kids do whatever. It's not a problem. Gambling, just, I can't even see the logic of it. Well, if I got money, I'm keeping it. I'm not going to lose it because the house always wins, right? So to me, that wasn't a big temptation. And I had said that from the pulpit. And I wasn't I wasn't trying to brag on I'm not weak, I'm strong, I'm I'm Mr. Impervious. That wasn't my point. My point was to say, know yourself and be aware of those liabilities because we all have them. But I in doing that, I would use that example and I'd say, well, you know, there's just some areas where I'm not that weak. And it was kind of a backward way of bragging. You know, I can't be tempted by gambling. I can't be tempted by alcohol. And I guess maybe the Lord had just heard that one too many times. And so one night I'm going home from the office as a pastor from the church office to my house. And I pass by, and this was before you were born. This was when I was pastoring my first church. So I'm in my twenties. I'm on my way home one night. And every night I passed this liquor store by. And like every liquor store, it's got those neon, you know, Michelob, Bud, whatever, I'm driving by, now I haven't had a drink probably since high school at this time, you know, or junior college or whatever, you know, long before I, before I committed uh, to Christ. So it's been many years since I've had any alcohol at this time. And so I'm driving by that thing and I see those neon signs and all of a sudden out of nowhere, this desire came, man, wouldn't a beer taste great? And I'm thinking, and all of a sudden I caught myself, what was that? Now, I, I didn't turn into the liquor store and buy a six-pack, so there's no bad end to this story, but it just caught me off guard. Where did that come from? And then it wasn't that long after that that, of course, we're pastoring in Bishop, California, which is four hours from Reno, four hours from Vegas, and four hours from L.A. So we would have guest ministers fly usually into Vegas or Reno because it was just as quick to get them there. So we had a friend of mine flew into one of those two. I don't remember which it was. might have been McLaren in Vegas, or it might have been... Um, Reno, but anyway, it was one of those two gambling capitals, right? And the joke was, whenever I was there with church members, because we had friends that were ministry pastoring there, and we'd go there sometimes to Reno or Vegas for whatever, really Reno. I don't think I'd been to Vegas by that time, up to that time. But Reno's where we'd generally pick them up. But we did pick up some people, I think, in McLaren at, uh, in Vegas. Anyway, the joke was, hey, pastor, got any quarters? I want to play these quarter slots because they knew my feelings about gambling. And I'd look at them and just kind of shake my head. And and there, it was just kind of a joke. So we went to pick up this minister friend of mine. We have him in tow. And we're walking by these slots. And I, for whatever reason, I happen to have a bunch of quarters in my pocket. Somebody made the old joke. Hey, pastor, why don't you give me? And before they could get it out of their mouth, I pulled out a wad of quarters and started throwing them in these slot machines, pulling these one-armed bandits. And I went down the whole row of them doing it. And I, I don't know where it came, the impulse came from. But I caught myself again. The very two things I said, I can't be tempted here. I had, you know, felt a pressure for the one and yielded to the other. I'm not saying it's sin to throw a quarter in a slot machine. If I had, I wouldn't have done it. But I was kind of doing it partly to kind of tease them, but partly because I just had this impulse. And I just, it, the Lord said to me through that, never mistake a lack of opportunity to sin for strong spiritual resolve. In other words, we criticize the guy who mishandled a million dollars when we've never even had a million dollars to steward. We criticized the guy who fell because he committed adultery with some woman, and yet we maybe we've just never been in a position to do the same thing. So we, we presume the strength of, well, I wouldn't have done such. And that's why when Paul talks about restoring a brother, he said, you which are spiritual, restore such one with a spirit of meekness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. In other words, don't go in there all cavalier like, well, I can't be touched here, so this is why I'm qualified to help this guy. No, we need to go in with humility and empathy, understanding all of us are made out of the same stuff, and we're all liable to temptation. It may be in different areas. It may be in the same area. 
We don't really know where we're strong. That's why Paul says, wherefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So when it comes to leadership, you know, there was the old Billy Graham rule, right, where Billy Graham had certain standards. And today those are mocked by much by many people in the world. When Mike Pence, Vice President Pence, said that he wouldn't have lunch with a woman apart from his wife, he got a lot of kickback from that. Because, you know, certain work environments, maybe you have to go to a business lunch or stuff, and people are saying, well, are they committing adultery if they do that? And his, that wasn't his point. His point was, I'm not going to put myself in a compromising position where either A, I can, you know, the appearance of evil, or number two, put myself in a position of genuine temptation. So I think it's just, you know, it's again to say, you can't be too careful, and you can't trust, don't put any confidence in the flesh. And I think we kind of naturally uh, flowed into one of the other points I had was that a leader walks in humility. And I have uh, the verse, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6. And I'm going to put on my glasses because I was yeah. struggling to read it last time. The <laughs> last verse. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Like you said, and I love the way that you've phrased it, a lack of opportunity does not equate to strength. And because there have been many times, and like I said, looking into the future of like wanting to be more in leadership and be able to lead God's people. And uh, one of the things I've actually listened to a lot recently are podcasts, and a lot of them have uh, circled around uh, uh, churches in America that have failed. And that sounds terrible, but I was just like, well, I want to learn from these. And But in those moments, you're hearing these stories and you hear about how they started with great intent. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, seemingly to the people outside, there were these moral failures. Yeah. But I think what you said was just right on the nose of a lack of opportunity does not equate to strength. And we all don't know our ability until we're put into that position. And in Proverbs 16, verse 18, it says, um, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So I think that we can get very confident with where we stand and then not realize that, I mean, the devil's always crouching at the door, waiting for his opportunity. He's yeah. setting snares and he's ready to prounce. I mean, our adversary, the devil roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's what yeah. the Bible says. And we all have these moments where we might be having an off day and it's rough or something's not going right. And all of a sudden a thought shoots through your mind and it's a temptation to sin. It's a temptation to give into something and maybe it's completely foreign, but it comes in those moments where we've been doing so well. And then it's just a rough day or it comes out of the blue and attacks you. And you don't, you've never planned your response. You've never had something prepared to say. Mm -hmm. And I love what one minister talked about is that, if you've never pre like prepared to say no to a situation arising, it makes it that much harder. He's like, I've prepared in my life to say no to certain things or expected that certain situations may arise and how I would respond to them. And he's like, and where I saw that happen very much was in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, the stories in the Bible when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness. Yeah. Every temptation that was brought before him, Jesus had a response of scripture. And that wasn't just by chance, he had spent so much time studying scripture and absorbing scripture and meditating on scripture that when a temptation came, he knew how to refute it with the word of God. Yeah. And uh, one of my friends reminded me uh, yesterday of the story of uh, counterfeit like detectors. They like they will detect counterfeit like hundred dollar bills and everything. They don't study all the counterfeits. They study the genuine article and get so familiar with it that when a counterfeit comes across it, they just know immediately it's fake. And they don't have to justify all the reasons. They just know. And yeah. it's the same way we should be operating in the word of God is that we're so full up on the word of God and spending time in the scripture and praying and meditating that we know the word of the Lord and a stranger's voice we will not follow. And this will help us to avoid that pride. And because I think, as I mentioned, a lot of leaders in America and even, I mean, in our own lives, we fall to this. You don't have to be a leader to fall to this, but we get so confident and prideful in an area and can fall so quickly. I, you know, as we're talking, I'm thinking something. I, you know, a lot of people will say something like, you know, when he, he was so humble and then he got a lot of authority, got a big church, got a large ministry, and then he got full of pride. I don't think so. I think it exposed the pride he already had. 
humility is not automatic because you have a small ministry. It's just you're not tempted to be prideful until you have something that the world says is worthy of being proud of. And, you know, we even, you know, I, I know Keith Moore has been a big influence on me in this area. He says, it's interesting because he says pride in every form is evil. In other words, I'm so proud to be an American. He And I, I love America. That's not what I'm saying. What he says is it's better to say I'm thankful for my country. You know, I'm so proud of my children. He says it's better to say I'm thankful for what God has done in my children. Pride puts an unnecessary emphasis on either them or on us. Look what I look how great a job I did raising my kids, or look how well they have achieved. Thankfulness says, thank God, He supplied the grace, the ability, whatever, for this success, for this nation, for this whatever. Thankfulness is a better solution than I'm so proud of. And I think that, like I said, I think that there's this assumption. You know, if you look at Saul and David, um, it talks about when Saul was small in his own eyes. Well, it's because he was small. He didn't have anything to be proud of. But all of a sudden, now you got a little bit of power. How many times have we heard, yeah, this guy was a great guy, and you gave him a little bit of power, and it ruined him? No, he was already ruined. He just didn't have the opportunity to show that aspect of his character or lack thereof. And so I think that that's why I think it's so important that those who lead serve first, serve under somebody, um, be in a position of service to others. And then you see leadership for what it is. It's service. Jesus, and we'll get to this, I'm sure, to the verses where he talks about, you know, um, the, the one who's going to lead, you know, must be servant of all. But the fact of the matter is, is in the kingdom of heaven, the way up is down. At leadership is just serving more people. So I, I think that if we can get a hold of that and enter into leadership with that right mindset, It'll help to curb a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, the pride. That's that's just immaturity, period. It's not just immaturity and leadership. It's just Christian immaturity. You know, I want to lead. I want to, why do we want a platform? Why do we want a mic, right? Why do we want to lead? I think all those things are good to ask. The older you get, the, the Brother Hagen used to say, you know, the more, the older you get, the more you realize it's just responsibility you wish you didn't have. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I know I'm saying no to a lot of opportunities that would put me in a certain light simply because I don't want, I don't want it. I, I, it's just, I have, you know, the, the less you have to prove because you know God is the author of whatever success or blessing you have, the the less you're quick to say yes to things that maybe God had never called you to do, because you need that validation. And if people, <laughs> is you know, we say the same thing sometimes about people who go into like say law enforcement because man, I just want to bust some heads. It's kind of the same thing in leadership. You know, if you go into leadership because you just want to be the leader probably not the place for you, right? So yeah, all these things are important. I think, again, humility has to be cultivated, and it's easier to cultivate it in positions of servanthood and recognize the value of servanthood than it is to, like I said, just aspire to be a leader for leadership's sake. Yeah, and I think you're just doing great. And then to the transitions, I think we can transition into one of my other points of that a leader should always be seeking to grow and to serve. Um, and as you mentioned, that one of the best opportunities to cultivate humility and prepare those answers before time. And I use that and I quote the John Wooden expression all the time because I love it. When opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. And so when an opportunity comes, we don't have the opportunity to build the character that we need and to learn the knowledge that we should have, to build the character, the skills, whatever that we needed. It's the moments there. Yeah. And so a servant should, or a leader should always be looking to, grow and to serve and become a servant. So two verses I have for that are Proverbs 16, 16, where it says, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is, uh, sorry, and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Yeah. And I love this verse because the scholarship group that I was a part of, and then I now get to uh, help mentor for, had this uh, verse as one of their key verses. And they are a scholarship group, obviously providing financial wherewithal to be able to go to school. But one of the other things that they did was provided us with mentors when we went somewhere. And it was to help us grow and learn because they recognized the leaders in this scholarship group recognized that even though they had been successful in the different areas of their life, that they had attained wealth, that they had attained different positions and everything, that all of that didn't matter if they didn't have wisdom. And I mean, King Solomon, when God asked him, like, what would you want? 
what do you want from me? Ask me of anything. He asked for wisdom to lead his people. And God gave him the riches in response in any ways because he was so humble to ask for wisdom. And the verse for um, serving is Mark 10, 45. It says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So I think that when we look at the Bible, and we look at what Jesus sets out, it's often referred to as the upside down kingdom. Because when you look at the kingdoms of the world in history, the kings sat on top, and then it was maybe the nobles, and then like the military class that were protecting them, and then the gentry and servants and all everyone else, it didn't matter. Yeah. But Jesus flipped that upside down where Yes, he was greatest of all, but he chose to be least of all serving people. He washed his disciples' feet where he should have been on the top and the disciples under him and them washing his feet. He washed their feet. He went out to the people below the disciples and loved them and gave himself of them freely and served them. And it's very contrary to what our society shows today of what is valuable in leadership, especially when you have a society that is very much a put your nose to the grindstone and whoever dies with the most toys wins. I mean, yeah. we have a culture right now that is looking at all the billionaires as the people we should be going to for advice. Not that they don't have great wisdom for financial aspects of how they accumulated that, but what does that do to make them chief moralists or any yeah. other area of our society? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I get, I get so talking this idea of contribution. What have they really done? Uh, it makes me so angry when I see these nonsensical, ridiculous things on YouTube that are garnering millions of followers and, you know, a huge following, and they're doing nothing but maybe destroying something or doing something silly and frivolous. But the people that are really contributing to our society are not getting value out of what they're producing. And I, I think it just goes to the silliness of our culture. But in, in you're talking about wisdom and and humility, and one of the best ways to display that is by surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you. I say smarter than you, wiser than you, have more experience than you. Um, you know, there hasn't yet been, well, no, I can't say that because I don't know these people individually, but we've had a lot of high profile ministers fall in recent time, a lot, lot. And out of every denomination, it used to be, you know, mega church pastors. Now we find out the Southern Baptist denomination has been covering up a sex scandal. Of course, we know about the Catholic Church, what it went through, and then high-profile individual ministers who have fallen in recent times. And I'm not saying this to criticize them. I'm saying this this is a reality of our day. And they are, I think, products to some degree of our environment, the church go, gone corporate, all that kind of stuff, You know, trying to just use worldly means of success to measure ministerial success. But I dare say that if 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 you were to look at some of these people, they were surrounded by a lot of yes men. They were surrounded by people that did not have the authority to tell them you're wrong or no, you can't do that. Or um, you know what I'm saying? I, th I think it's just important that we recognize our own limitations, our own corruptibility. Um, what is it? Or Lord Acton said power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Anyone who doesn't believe that just hasn't lived longer than a day. And I don't care how noble you start out. If you have unchecked power, it's probably going to go south in a hurry. And and even if your heart is good, you'll make mistakes that could have been averted had you just had smart people surrounding you. And it's scary because whenever we have checks and balances, to some degree, we're trusting ourselves to people that are also flawed. So there is no perfect system here. But I think it's just foolish not to have counsel from people that have maybe more experience in a given area. Um, you know, I'm not a businessman at all. So if I were ever to pioneer another, I, I oversee a church now and, you know, various ministries. But if I were to start a church again, I would definitely solicit the wisdom of, you know, smarter businessmen to help on that front. I would solicit, obviously, people that have skill in you know, various departments that I don't have. I, I can't, I'm very limited. We're all very limited. So part of the humility of wisdom is surrounding yourself with people that um, maybe exceed you, your wisdom or your knowledge level or whatever you want to call it in certain areas. And then make sure that there are checks and balances in place. Um, you know, what was one of the emperors? 
was it Octavian or Augustine had a man whose job it simply was Octavian. To, it's Octavian. an apocryphal story of uh, Octavian Caesar. Okay, yeah. yeah, it's not true, but I love the the thought. And, and the man just followed him around, saying, "You're only a man. You're only a man." <laughs> But yeah. there's something to be said for that. We need people following us around and say, listen, you're not as cool as you think you are. Don't believe your own press. Um, because, you know, in leadership, there's this image that's and that may be a good thing to talk about is the image of leadership. The image of leadership is always, you know, in a suit with its best foot f put forward, be best foot forward. The reality of leadership is that it's hammered out in back rooms difficult decisions being made, sleepless nights, you know, that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Good decisions. And and I think that there is a, a celebrity image. You and I talked about this before the broadcast, a celebrity image that's being portrayed now in ministry that I think is extraordinarily unhealthy because there couldn't be anything more opposite of the image that Jesus presented of a minister, including himself, washing the disciples' feet. There couldn't be anything that's more diametrically opposed to that than the idea of a celebrity pastor. Well, people say, well, yeah, but didn't Jesus have celebrity? Well, in a way, yes, but no. He didn't seek celebrity. He became known because he was meeting the needs of people, and people were going where the need was met. In fact, he even exposed that when he told the people, you didn't come because you wanted to hear the Word of God. You came because you ate the loaves and fishes. You know, you rebuked them. And so, yeah, there was, you know, there was a time where Jesus, it was like Elvis or, you know, Michael Jordan, everybody wanted to get a piece of Jesus, but Jesus was never seeking celebrity status. In fact, how many times did he say when the crowds were waiting for him, I got to go somewhere else because I was sent for them too. So, and, and oftentimes he hid himself with the crowd. He had sent the crowds away. He did everything he could to deny that aspect that so many people are clamoring for. Um, and I just, I just think it's something to be aware of, especially for young leaders. Um, these are role models being put out there that other ministers are following. That, that's why we're having more than one of them. You know, that's why it's a cautionary tale because it's been repeated because people have followed that model and it's a dangerous model to follow. And so I think it's really important. Again, young leaders need old leaders that father them, that disciple them, that hold them accountable. And, you know, I, I had, it rankles me so bad, Cameron. I, I know people in positions of leadership, I'll say it with ear quotes, that I know personally, I know because I talk to them personally, that have never served under a local pastor. They've never contributed to a local church, but they'll criticize. I, 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 I could go take you back to the text, to the Facebook post, to, you know, I wrote essays based on this stuff. You know, I remember when one of these individuals provoked me to write one of the essays, it's one of my books, talking about how there's no church anointed enough or, you know, gifted enough or, you know, flowing with the Holy Ghost enough for them. And so think about what all that implies. I'm more spiritual. I'm so spiritual, more spiritual than all these guys who've been called of God, spent years burning the midnight oil, studying the Word of God, seeking God for His anointing. But I'm more spiritual than all of them. And so now they're in a position of the leadership that's been given to them, handed them by somebody, because, you know, they can talk a good talk. And I'm not saying that God doesn't have a call on their life, but I think this is just, it's just the wrong way to do it. We all ought to be serving someone. You know, I've always said, we, God will call you to serve alongside some and under others that will rub you the wrong way to change you, not to change them, but to change you. Friction has a great way of rubbing off the rough spots. And so I think it's important that we go through the challenges because when you serve under people, you're going to, guess what? You're going to serve under imperfect people. And, and I've, I've seen people struggle with this. Well, my pastor is making a bad decision. Well, guess what? You will too. How do you want someone to handle it when you make that bad decision and they're under your authority? All those things have to be lived through. So this is why humility is so important, Cameron, because people want to circumvent that and get into a position where they're calling the shots and they're the boss. I, 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 I had a, you know, I've started recent, recently, I started a job as you know, as a hospice chaplain. And I've been in ministry a long time. And this is a form of ministry. Of course, there's other aspects to it too. You know, there's certain government uh, requirements, things you have to fulfill, documentation you have to have. But I had a brief meeting with my supervisor today. Once a month, he likes to talk to everybody that's, you know, under his authority. And so he brought me in and chatted with me. Hey, how does it, how are you doing? How are things feeling for you? And, you know, it was really good. It was a really great conversation. Things are going really, really well. And I, and, and he said, do you have any questions? I said, not now, but he said, 
I said, you know, the great thing is everybody's so collaborative, everybody's so helpful. So I said, I have no problem asking you a question if I don't know, you know, if I don't know the answer to something. And there's a lot of, I, I consider myself the dumbest guy there because yeah, I've been in ministry a long time, but that has nothing to do with his job. This job is different, right? And so I told him, I said, listen, I said, if you ever see me doing anything that is not, you know, because I'm actually older than my supervisor. And, and of course he has the authority to say to me whatever he wants. But I just said, if you ever see me doing anything that is not right, please tell me. I said, I'm teachable. And he said, yeah, you are. And I, I, that, that touched my heart that he recognized that. And I want everybody to recognize that, you know, even if it's, even if it has to do with something that I'm doing that I've done all my life, and maybe I do better than someone, it, I, I want them to always feel like maybe it's like it has to do with communication or, you know, serving as a professor or serving as a pastor or something I've done for years. I want people to feel free to speak into my life and give me constructive criticism because that's how you get better. If you're in an echo chamber where the only thing you ever hear is praise, how glorious and wonderful you are, you re it, it totally takes away from your potential for further growth. So you've got to have people that love you enough, you know, to speak constructively into your life and say, you know, this might be a better way to look at that. And, you know, of course, there's ways to do that effectively as well. You and I were talking about this idea of give people something, don't take something away from people, you know, give them encouragement, give them things to do. Don't just criticize what they're doing. But nevertheless, we need we need to give people permission to tell us when we're wrong or when we're not doing something right. And if we're not doing that, then obviously we, we're we're not going to grow. And and as leaders, we have to grow, as you said earlier. Absolutely. And I like what you said, that we should be giving something. And you talked about uh, the image of leadership. And it made me think of this movie called The Emperor's Club. And I know you've seen it, um, but many of you have probably not seen this movie, but it's one of my favorite movies because it's about a history teacher. And history was the subject that I studied in college. And I love the movie um, just because it talks about um, great men, the ideas they have passed on. But there's just one scene in the movie. And so I might spoil it if you guys are ever interested in watching it. But it's at the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> And all the, yeah, it's a little late for you guys to be missing the spoilers, but um, they're all the boys are coming in the classroom for the first time. He's sitting down, getting to know all their names and all the boys are like, have said their names and everything. And he's starting the class session. And he asks one of the guys in the front, Marty Blythe uh, is his name, if you care at all. Uh, he asks him to get up and go to the back of the classroom and read the plaque that's on the back. And so he looks up at the plaque and I want to get this plaque someday for my office, but it says, I'm Shutruk Nahante. King of Amshand and Susa, sovereign of the land of Alam, I destroyed Sapar and I took the steel of Niran Sim back to Alam, where I erected it as an offering to my god, Shutrik Nahante, 1158 BC. And so the plaque's up there and all the boys are like, okay. And he's like, who can tell me who Shutrik Nahante is? And all of them, because it's a very studious school, procedure school, they start opening their books looking. He's like, books are permitted. And he's like, but you won't find him there. And they all kind of like stop and they're like, what are we supposed to do? And the point of that he makes is that this plaque is stating, I am Shutruk Nahante, king of Ansand and Susa, two huge lands, sovereign of the land of Alam. He destroyed a nation. He took this offering back, did this great conquest. And what he ends up saying is that great ambition and conquest without contribution is without significance. And I love that. And that's one of the reasons I want that plaque is just as a reminder that because we look at our world, we look at leadership, we see the people that are accumulating wealth, they accumulate power, but it means nothing in the end that having humility and realizing that we need to contribute, that we are to be servant of all, what does the image of leadership really look like? And we can have all these different ideas in society and they have had these different ideas. I remember studying in history what the Romans viewed as what a man should be, what a leader should be. But a lot of these people that they hailed as leaders and real men aren't remembered. Their names are wiped out of history. And it's the men that Rome killed, like Socrates, um, or maybe it was Greek that killed Socrates. But they, all these men that were killed for their ideas or their contributions, I mean, um, trying to remember if it was Galileo or Copernicus that was burned at the stake for his belief. Like all these men brought great contributions and were contributing something. Jesus was someone that, yeah, we could say he's famous, but he was more infamous in his day that he got crucified for the contribution that he brought. He didn't care about the conquest. He didn't care about the ambition. What he cared about was bringing something of value to people. Yeah. And I think this image of leadership is often 
overlooked in our society, especially right now, because it doesn't give you the monetary value. It doesn't give gratification to your, like your flesh. It requires something much deeper from you. I was trying to remember if it was in David McCullough's book, one of his books, David McCullough is an author who's written a lot about uh, history. I guess you call them uh, historical biographies. He wrote probably the one he's most famous for is John Adams. And they made a mini series out of it um, that Tom Hanks produced. And then there was, um, one on Truman, but when he was talking about, I think it must have been in the Adams. There's also one he wrote called 1776, but I believe it was McCullough that brought out the point that what made the founding fathers so great, you know, if you look at George Washington's cabinet, oh my God, you talk about a flipping brain trust, right? Alexander Hamilton, um, Thomas Jefferson. John Adams is his vice president. And then, um, is it John Jay? I, I, you know, that was the uh, head of the um, judiciary. I forget. I'm, I'm getting confused. But anyway, if you just look at his cabinet, never was there an assembled brain trust like that. You know, Washington, the only president, unanimously selected two, two different times. But you have guys like Adams and others, um, Alexander Hamilton, Madison, equally brilliant man. All these founding fathers, I've read so much about the founding fathers in that whole period of time, but it was McCullough who made the observation that what made them great wasn't their brilliance. There have been a lot of brilliant people. It was the opportunity because of the need and their brilliance applied to the need. In other words, to put it succinctly, their contribution, because they used that brilliance to serve a greater purpose than themselves. And if you have it, there's a book on the signers of the Declaration. Many of them lost their lives. They lost fortunes. Um, some of them literally went from riches to rags um, instead of rags to riches because of, you know, their sacrifice for our republic. And and that's what leadership in America used to be. I remember, you know, uh, Madison, who's maybe one of the most brilliant of the founders. He was the one who convinced George Washington, listen, if you don't serve as the president of the constitutional convention this thing won't hold together you're the only one with the clout to do this madison never got paid for being in in government his father subsidized his his leadership and had he not had a farm and a father with enough money to underwrite his service to our nation he would have been back home plowing the fields or something um and back then that's how it was now washington was the richest man in the nation so he could do it for free but and so we have, you know, like a Trump that does it for free and donates his salary. But for the most part, you know, people, you know, people come into government not making all that much and they leave, you know, as millionaires. Truman said, anybody that does that's a crook. You know, my point being that it used to be that you sacrificed to serve. It was all about contribution. It was about investing yourself into something larger than yourself. I think we would all quickly say that that ideal has largely vanished in public service. When it vanishes in ministry, though, then leadership in the church has become something other than biblical leadership. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't get paid. The Bible said, you know, those that uh, minister the Word of God, in fact, the Bible said they're worthy of double honor, referring to finance, referring to um, remuneration. But the idea that, you know, people are doing this for glory or for, you know, Jesus dealt with these issues, you know, ain't for glory. You know, the one who's going to wash your feet and be servant of all, he's the one who's going to lead. Um, you know, if you're invited to take the head of the table, take the foot of the table. These, this, this idea of humility is baked into the biblical idea of leadership. And yet, I, would, I think we would all admit that um, this idea of contribution, using what I have for an ideal better, bigger than me, you know, planting trees under whose shade I may never sit, has been greatly lost to this generation in which we're living. Yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, I would say there's a number of other traits we'd want to get into, but I think we might have to save it for another time. I was about yeah. to start getting into one, and then I looked up at the time, but well, we'll just continue next week. I'm sure there's enough yeah. we can probably continue on into next week with it. But I just want to encourage you guys that if anyone listening, that if you're in leadership now or you're looking to get into leadership, it's not too late to start applying these characteristics, these traits. It's not too late and we'll get into more in the next weeks coming, but we just kind of went over a few of 
I mean, walking in humility, seeking wisdom, seeking to serve. I mean, putting God first, these are just basic fundamentals, but, and we'll probably get in next week. And we kind of, you kind of mentioned it briefly on accountability, find people to live this walk with you, find people to encourage you in leadership, to build you up. If you're not in leadership anyways, and you want to start applying these, I mean, we live the, we, how do I, should I say this? The stories that we think that are worth remembering. And I, uh, in the Lord of the Rings, I think Sam makes the good statement of like, you want to hear the stories where the, like the good overcomes the evil. And in the end, it shines out for the better. And he's like, those are the stories that mattered. Cause it reminds you that there is good in the world and it's still worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. And the things that we remember in society and our, in our world are the people that contributed, that did accomplished great things. And even more so for God, I mean, the most famous person to have ever lived is Jesus. I mean, if you think for thousands of years, one of the, if not the most popular figure in the world has been Jesus. He was someone out of Nazareth, a know-nothing town who ministered in a very small section of the world for three years. And his name is still remembered. If you want to accomplish something that matters, and I think it was Hillsong that used to have a song, or I mean, they wrote the song, I want to leave a legacy. How will they remember me? And it's by doing something great for God. And it's not too late to start now. I mean, we think that all these people that accomplished great things had to have started when they're young, but there's so many people that accomplished amazing things that didn't start till they were much older. So just spend some time in prayer, spend some time reading and just dive deeper into what you feel God's calling you to, what leadership looks like, what you're supposed to, what mantle are you supposed to take up? What legacy are you supposed to leave? And you'll be surprised at what God might challenge you to do. I I think as we close this for tonight, Cameron, I'm reminded of one of my favorite statements that I've shared a number of times. You've heard me share before, you and I have talked about this before, but when John Maxwell, who's kind of known now as the leadership guru, I guess, of our generation, um, Eric Metaxas was asking him, you know, of course, he, he had made his famous statement, leadership is influence, full stop. And I think most of us probably recognize that, that that to be true. It's not the guy that has the title. It's the guy who people will follow. And that speaks again to character. It speaks to, again, influence. And so Eric Metaxas asked him, well, then how do you increase your influence? And without missing a beat, Maxwell said, add value to people. That has become, I mean, I think the leadership is influence statement is great, but the add value to people has become kind of like my marching orders. I have a friend who God has blessed financially because he followed him doing a very specific, he had some very specific marching orders. And, and as he did, so God blessed him and prospered him. And, and I wasn't saying this in the sense of, Lord, I want to be prospered. I was saying this more like in the sense of, what, Lord, what are my marching orders? You know, sometimes it's just nice to have something concise. You know, what's what's the vision for my life? Well, you know, well, to preach and teach, to make disciples. But I wanted something simple. And and it could be it could be said of hopefully everything that I'm engaged in now, whether it's as a hospice chaplain, as an author, as a teacher, communicator. And that is, I want to, add, it's just add value to people. And you can do that with a compliment. You can do that buying them lunch. And all these are characteristics that I think are part of what it is to be a leader, to make a positive impression in the lives of people for nothing more than just the value of getting to be like Jesus and serving them, serving the purpose of Christ in the earth. It has a reward baked into it. There's just something about the feeling you get doing good and doing good to others that is in itself its own reward, even if no one sees it. There's just something no ennobling <laughs> about living that way. And so I guess that's what I would, you know, if you want to be a leader, go be one by example, and then let the title find you. But go be a leader. In other words, exemplify the character of a leader, and leadership will find you. Don't seek the title. Seek the character. Seek the characteristics. And if you do so, I believe whatever position of leadership God wants you to ultimately be in, you'll be in. And all of us on some level are leaders, whether it's fathers, whether it's just Christians, disciples that are influencing the world. We're all leaders in some capacity. So we all need to be good Christians and disciples to get there.
Absolutely. Um, I'll just close with some prayer on that note. Lord, I just pray that for those that are listening, that are desiring to go deeper with you, to be leaders in their spheres of influence, that you just start softening their hearts to become servants in those spheres of influence, whether it's in schools, whether it's in a professional setting, maybe blue collar work, white collar, wherever they are, Lord, we just pray that you're softening their hearts to become more humble, willing to serve, seek out wisdom, and just put you first so that they can honor you, that they can start leading people and that they can say, follow me as I follow Christ, because that's what Paul said to us. And we pray that we able are able to get to that place where we can tell people, follow me as I follow Christ, and just point them towards a better future, that we can add value to people, that we can bring contribution to this world that is for your glory, for yes. your kingdom. Yes. We pray that if anyone here is listening and they don't know you, that they will call out on you right now. And if that's you and you're listening and you just want to call out on to God as Lord, just say the simple prayer with me. Lord, I ask that you become my God. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I accept your son as my savior, and I believe that he died for my sins. Yes, Lord. I commit my life to you. Thank you, Jesus. What you say for me to do, I will do. What you say for me to say, I will say, and I will follow you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good chance we'll probably come back next week with a part two and uh, unless the Lord leads us elsewise, but that's what we'll probably look to do maybe. So, all right, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Cameron, for the subject matter. I think it was a good start, at least on that subject, and uh, we'll pursue more of it next week. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. God bless. Bye-bye.